Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs here. Today we're going to be talking about CBD oil and its potential benefits in the setting of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. We're also going to be talking about some of the benefits of CBD oil uh, as it relates to your thyroid and other systems in your body. We'll talk about safety and we'll talk about some other things as well. Um, I'm pretty excited about CBD oil as a potential therapy for Hashimoto's. Uh, I, I haven't used it a lot personally quite yet. I have some people in the testing stages. Um, so if you're listening to this and you have used it, especially in the setting of any thyroid disease, but um, Hashimoto specifically as well, please do leave your comments below because I'd like to gain as much information as I can about that. So for those of you though, however, who perhaps have not heard about CBD oil, I find that hard to believe, but perhaps you haven't um, heard about using CBD oil to treat something like Hashimoto's, but that's probably more realistic. I want to talk about that connection between uh, those two things first and talk about how it might help. So CBD um, is, it stands for cannabidiol, and basically, if you're confused about this thing, uh, what it is, let me just briefly sort of explain it here. So like I said, CBD stands for cannabidiol, and it's one of many cannabinoids found inside of marijuana. Yeah, yes, it's found in some other things as well, but that's probably the setting of which you sort of understand it or which you are familiar with it. Now, what's important here is I don't want you to think that CBD is marijuana. They're two separate things. CBD is found within marijuana, and it's not even the thing that causes, or at least the thing that we think causes, the high uh, inside of marijuana. That's, that's reserved for something known as THC. So even though THC and CBD are technically both uh, cannabinoids, CBD is the thing that locks onto certain receptors in the body and it, uh, exerts its influence on certain systems and tissues. And that's really the thing that we're focusing on. And that's really the reason why CBD has been labeled uh, or is available over the counter. Uh, because it's felt to be safe, uh, it's been looked at, it has a bunch of studies showing that it's potentially efficacious, and so on. So if you wanted to see the, the difference between cannabidiol and THC, which is, there's the name for it, you can take a look there. So really what we're interested in is how CBD impacts certain receptors in your body and where those receptors sit. Because if we can identify where those receptors are, then obviously if you're taking in this CBD and it's impacting these receptors on certain tissues, we want to know what are those tissues and how is it impacting your body, um, positively or negatively. In this case, it happens to be mostly positive. So we know that these receptors are located in certain areas. So those include the limbic, limbic system, and that's the system that controls a lot of your pleasure, right? Um, the hypothalamus is another one that has it, and you probably are familiar with the hypothalamus because it's important in thyroid function, it's important in um, regulating your appetite, your metabolism, and so on. Um, they also have receptors inside your gastrointestinal tract, which is important for your thyroid, but also, again, for appetite and metabolism and weight. And then lastly, in your um, uh, adipose or fat tissue, right? It's another, another name for the same thing. And you guys probably know, if you've been listening to a lot of my podcasts and such, that your fat cells are not inert. Uh, tissues, right? They actually produce certain hormones that feed back to your brain. And so one of those really, really, really important hormones is known as leptin. And so right away we have these, let's say, four powerful systems that are influenced potentially by CBD in the endocannabinoid system um, via receptors. And so what I think is really interesting here is that you as a patient now have the potential opportunity to impact these, these systems with the use of something which is available over the counter. And that's really interesting. Um, but we've talked about so far, we've talked about a lot of these benefits, and we'll talk about more, of, more about how to get CBD and things like that as we go on. But we've talked about all of these systems here, but we haven't mentioned the thyroid. So I want to talk about CBD potentially in the setting of impacting the thyroid specifically. Right? So let's move on to that. Now, it turns out that there are a number of studies which show that CBD, um, and actually marijuana, too, by the way, but we're going to leave these, we're going to separate these two, two things for now. But um, there are three main ways that I've found as I've been researching this and looking into it in how CBD may impact your thyroid. So I think the, especially in the setting of Hashimoto's, which is really what we're talking about here, right? Um, so the number one thing, and not in terms of order, but just for how we're going to go through here, is how CBD impacts your immune system. Now, I don't want to get too technical here, um, but we can kind of describe your immune function in, in this way using this analogy. So you can kind of think of it as a spectrum between a pro-inflammatory state, uh, which means it's, it's for inflammation and it increases inflammation, and an anti-inflammatory state, which exact, means the exact opposite. Now, this is kind of like a balance, right? It's a spectrum, and you're somewhere in the middle. Now, you want to be in the middle where your body says, you know, there's, there's not too much and there's not too little so that there's no inflammation, period. Now, if you tip one way over the other, then obviously you can get into problems. And as you tip one way or the other, that's when you start to get into, you start to develop autoimmune conditions, your body attacking itself, lots of inflammation systemically in your body, and so on. 
So what CBD seems to do is it seems to reduce those cytokines or these messengers in your body which trigger inflammation. So it's simultaneously reducing those things which trigger inflammation and increasing those things which suppress inflammation or, or suppress inflammation. So this is a great thing, especially for those with Hashimoto's. You want this to happen. Now you can do this through other ways too, right? Like remember we've talked about some of these things such as such as diet, some other things such as um, prescription medications like low dose naltrexone. There are other ways of doing this, but this is how CBD tends to impact the this immune system. Which again is obviously really good if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis or I should say any other autoimmune disease uh, or just any inflammation in your body period. And you'll, you'll know if you fit that category because you probably have an elevated ESR or an elevated CRP. So that's one way that CBD is impacting your thyroid. Number two would be it ha actually has a direct impact on your thyroid gland itself. Now this is this gets a little bit confusing, so I, I'm going to break it down, and um, this is where we're not exactly sure how things are working out. But um, it, I, I, so just kind of bear with me as we go through this. Um, so we have a couple studies, and I think that might be concerning when you look at them um, on you know at first glance. So in one of those studies that showed that CBD is associated with a reduction, right, a, re a reduced amount of free T3 and free T4. Now, simultaneously, that study also showed that those people who had the reduced free T3 and free T4 also had a reduced TSH. Um, in addition, it also showed that those people, um, that CBD seems to have a protective effect on increasing autoantibodies to your thyroid. So we can already explain the, the antibodies away, right? That's obviously a good thing. But what might be confusing is why, why or how is it reducing your free T4 and free T3? And isn't that a bad thing? And not necessarily. Uh, and so this, that's why I kind of want to explain this just for a second. So I don't know why it is the case that this is occurring, but my feeling is that it probably has something to do with how sensitive your cells are to free T3 and free T4. So if you can imagine a scenario where you kind of have two ways to increase how much um, thyroid hormones is impacting your cells. Number one would be just brute force it. Let's just increase more free T3 and free T4. Um, let's get let's get all the thyroid that we can inside your body, and let's brute force the cells. And eventually, one of those cells is going to pick up pick up a thyroid receptor, and it's going to activate, and then we're going to get the things that we want. So that's one way of doing it. The second way would be, well, how about we just keep the same amount of thyroid hormone that we have, but let's make our cells more sensitive to it. So that way we don't actually have to increase the amount of thyroid hormone that exists and we can get the same benefit. You can do one or the other. Now most of us are focused on the first because that's what we do when we take thyroid medication. We're trying to brute force our way through the door, you know, with a battering ram to get in there um, by just taking more thyroid hormone, which is putting more in your system and, and it's uh, putting it, you know, it's forcing its way in. What CBD might be doing is by reducing inflammation, especially at the cellular level, cellular level, it might be making the free T4 and the free T3 that you have more effective, which means that you don't need as much thyroid hormone, which might be the reason why the TSH is being suppressed and why you also get the benefit of having reduced antibodies. So again, I, we don't really know. I don't really know. That's just a speculation, uh, but it seems plausible to me um, as to that might be the, the reason that we're seeing the, uh, that benefit. That's number two. Number three is CBD has an impact on, on your hypothalamus or hypothalamic function. Now, you probably know, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier, uh, that your hypothalamus controls somewhat indirectly, or I shouldn't say controls, but it's, it's associated with changes in your thyroid hormone, particularly changes in T3. Uh, to the point that if you have stimulation in the hypothalamus, which is the regulator of your metabolism, uh, your your uh, weight, your appetite, and then also the amount of heat that you produce. And all of those things are tied, about 60% of them anyway, to T3 levels. So anything which stimulates or, or increases hypothalamic function is also going to cause some increase indirectly in your T3, which obviously comes from your thyroid. And that could be from the production of T3 directly from the thyroid gland or from increased production of T3 from T4. That's, you know, through T, T4 to T3 conversion. But we have another avenue by which CBD is probably impacting your thyroid um, for the benefit, I would say, in this case. So those are three main ways that I think um, we, could, we could definitively say, and the studies kind of point to that, that, that um, CBD is impacting positively Hashimoto's. Now, you might listen to those things and think, well, that's enough for me to want to try. And we haven't even gotten to the, to the five reasons why I think you should consider it. So I want to talk about those. Now, before we use any medication, we always want to look, or I shouldn't say medication because this is an over-the-counter over supplement, but before we use any therapy, we'll, we'll say, you want to 
you want to know is it effective, but you also want to know how safe is it to use. Because we don't really care if something is, is effective, but it's also you know incredibly harmful to your body, right? That's not, that's not a trade-off that you want to make. And um, what I have to say for CBD is that it actually has a fairly strong safety profile. Now, when it comes to supplements, you should know, you probably know, that they're not really held to the same standards um, as pharmaceutical medications. And what I mean, and we know in multiple ways, but the way I want to focus on here is in its safety. So we know that pharmaceutical medications, they have a lot more leeway when it comes to safety than supplements do. And I illustrate that when I, with an example here as I talk about statins. So statins, which are used very frequently for treating high cholesterol, they, they have a lot of side effects that are associated with them. So one of those is that for every 24 people that use statins, one will develop muscle, jam, muscle damage. It's called a myopathy. And we know that it's, 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 been, as, it's been estimated as uh, frequent as 1 in 10 as well, but 1 in 24 seems to be the number we're settling on right now. In addition, it seems about one, one out of every 204 patients or so, give or take some numbers here, will develop diabetes because of the medication that they're taking. So these are massive risks, you know, um, really big risks with, associated with these medications. Now, the question I pose to you, can you imagine if you were taking any medication that caused type 2 diabetes? Would that be around on the market? Absolutely not. So in that way, it's a little lopsided in terms of what uh, consumers are willing to accept when it comes to pharmaceuticals versus what they're willing to accept when it comes to over-the-counter supplements. So if it's so, most supplements are by by virtue of this are incredibly safe, and CBD seems to be no different. So I think the only things that I could find that it was associated with side effect wise include nausea, fatigue, diarrhea, and changes in weight or appetite. So really minor things, um, the, n nothing, nothing serious. And these sort of symptoms can be associated with changes in your diet, right? It's not that big of a deal. So when we look about the, the potential benefits for the safety profile, I think we can check that off and say, yep, looks good. So number two is it has additional benefits beyond just its impact or treatment of, of or management of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So there's four specific areas that I want to touch on here. Number one is it can potentially help reduce anxiety. Number two is it can potentially help improve your sleep. Number three, it can potentially reduce pain. And number four, it can potentially reduce inflammation. Yeah, yes, we've talked about the inflammation, but uh, remember there's a difference between inflammation in the body and then also immune dysregulation that leads to autoimmunity, which is what Hashimoto's patients have. Well, actually they tend to have both, but they are two separate things. So as you look at these things, um, what are you thinking inside of your head? So you're probably thinking, well, a lot of, and you would be correct, a lot of patients who have Hashimoto's also have anxiety. A lot of patients who have Hashimoto's also suffer from sleep disturbances. A lot of patients who have Hashimoto's also suffer from extra pain. And then, of course, we already talked about the inflammation. So now we have a potential tool which can treat both of these conditions simultaneously if they exist in the same uh, person. Yes, it's possible that you could have Hashimoto's and none of these, but it's also possible you could have Hashimoto's and all of these, or one of these, or two of these, etc. And so now we have an extra reason that, that you might want to consider taking it because of its impact on these additional things, additional areas. And so if I were um, a patient considering it, I would look and ask myself, what other things am I also dealing with? And if they fit those things, well, then it might be worth a, a trial of using CBD for that purpose. Um, so there was one other thing that I wanted to mention here about that. Oh, and that is this. Um, it's also possible for those people who have Hashimoto's um, to get no benefit uh, from by using CBD on their thyroid, but they might get benefit when it comes to their anxiety or their sleep or their pain. And so it might be worth it to consider using it, even if it doesn't have any benefit on your thyroid in your case. Yes, we talked about the ways that in which it might help, but that doesn't guarantee that it's going to work in all people in those ways that we mentioned above. Um, but if, let's say it doesn't, worst case scenario, but it helps you with your anxiety or your sleep or your pain or your other inflammation. So there are a lot of reasons to potentially consider it beyond your thyroid. And in fact, I would say most people probably don't use it for their thyroid. They probably are using it for anxiety and sleep and pain. Um, because its potential uh, benefit would be a reduction in the use of um, opioids or narcotics, which a lot of which those are very dangerous um, if used in incorrect amounts, um, and that's a big issue for us right now. So anyway, that's number two. Number three is another therapy for Hashimoto's. Now I hear this a lot um, in various ways, but I I like to share my experience uh, with with patients and I. Probably some some doctors are also listening to this and health coaches and things like that. And a lot of the therapies that I share are 
me using prescription medications on patients. Um, and then patients will hear that and they'll, they'll try and go get in that their doctor's not willing to prescribe it. And so obviously there's a little bit of frustration there um, because I'm telling them that they, sh they, sh they should do something, but then they can't get it done, right? So there's some frustration there. And the thing that stands in their way is the doctor and his or her prescription pad because it requires somebody with, with a license to write that prescription for them. Um, and, you know, I, I, I totally, I totally feel that. I, I think that that's, um, that's a very difficult aspect. I'm trying, I'm working on solving that right now. I don't have a good answer for it, I'm, but I'm working on it. Uh, but I want to keep sharing these things because I still think they have value um, for people who can get them. But we don't have to worry about that when it comes to CPD. And the reason for that is it's available over the counter. Um, and so the fact that it's available over the counter means that pretty much uh, most of you can, who are listening to this are, can get it, at least if you live in the United States. Um, it's available in most states, at least to some degree, with varying degrees of restriction um, in all of these states. So it might be difficult to get the exact dose or specific type and things like that, but it's still available um, in some way. And I think you can get it on places like Amazon as well. I, although I'd be careful buying supplements on Amazon for obvious reasons, um, because you don't know about the quality. Uh, but most people can get it. Um, and in addition to that, uh, it, it can be used as another therapy for Hashimoto's. And so I've talked about some of the therapies of Hashimoto's before, which include things like lifestyle changes, changing your diet, adding prescription medications such as low-dose naltrexone, um, optimizing your supplement regimen to um, optimize the inflammatory, pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines and so on. So there's lots of things that you can do. Um, however, there are not many that your doctor can give you. And so I think that when we're talking about Hashimoto's, this is pretty exciting for those patients because it's, you know, one of, let's say, seven or eight therapies. That's not very many, right? If we're talking about hypothyroidism, there's probably 20. Uh, but for Hashimoto's, not quite that many. So it's exciting. Uh, number four, availability over the counter. We kind of added that into this top one here, which is talking about another therapy for Hashimoto's. So we won't go over that. And then lastly, one other reason to consider it would be patient success stories. And so what I'm talking about here, um, well, let, let's, 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 pose it in this way. So there are two sort of ways that I look at um, therapies before I recommend them or before I talk about them. First, I like to see uh, that they have some sort of clinical study or clinical foundation which supports their use in some setting. Um, however, that's not all I like to see. I also like to see patients and, and clinical stories and things like that of people who have used it themselves, who have seen something positive as a result of that. And really, the magic happens when you put those two things together. And here's why it matters. I've had many, many situations where I look at the clinical studies and I think to myself, oh, this is awesome. This is really exciting. I'm going to use this um, X therapy for Y set of patients because it, the studies are very promising in this way. So I get really excited. Um, I get the supplements. I give it to them or whatever it is. It could be a medication, whatever. I give it to them and then I just do not see uh, any of the benefit that was explained or what I was supposed to see in the study. And so that's really frustrating to me. I'm sure it's really frustrating to the patients as well. There seems to be, in some instances, a mismatch between what the studies are showing and what you actually see in real life. Um, and so if you don't have the patient success stories, um, it's easy to fall into that trap. But if you have the studies and you have the patient success stories, those success stories can kind of act as a, what we'll call a proof of concept. And so the patients can say, yeah, I've used it and it's already working. And a lot of patients, by the way, are doing these therapies before the studies come out. And so they're, they're out there saying, hey, this works. And then people, the research is like, you know, catching up or, or falling behind them in some instances and saying, yeah, actually, we, we see these benefits. Here they are. And then it takes a while of this back and forth before doctors get on board and they say, yeah, this is definitely the thing that you guys should be doing. Um, and so I think that we're kind of in the early stages of that. People are, are seeing some benefit. They're explaining their benefit. And then doctors are looking at the studies and they're saying, well, yeah, actually, I can see how this might be beneficial. Um, also, it's pretty safe, which is a really good thing. Um, and so if you put these things together, there's potential benefit for a lot of patients. So I really do, I think having those patient success stories um, are a really good thing. Obviously, you don't want to just look at those success stories because just because it works in one or two people it may not work in the other 98, in which case it's something you should you know, think about, but, but not seriously think about. Okay. So that's number five. Um, and then I think the last thing I would post to you is whether or not you should try it. Now, the only downside I can see, uh, so far, and there, there may be others, uh, but so far in my research and in, in looking at this, the only downside that I, I wasn't too thrilled about is the fact that 
the way CBD works, um, it's not working to completely reverse the underlying conditions which caused Hashimoto's or thyroid problem to begin with. Um, so my concern is, yes, you'll get some benefit or it may get some benefit, I should say. Um, but what happens when you stop the CBD? Is it a long-term thing? Is it a short-term thing? Uh, that's not really clear to me. So I, I, could, I could see it both ways where in some cases you get some benefit, but as soon as you stop taking it, that benefit is lost. And so I would prefer, and I think most patients would, to see some sort of benefit that when they take a therapy that, that whatever they're looking for is reversed and then they don't have to continue taking it forever. Now, that would be in a perfect world. Uh, that doesn't always happen, obviously, um, for a lot of reasons. We don't always know what causes the, the issues that you have. Or if we do, sometimes they're, we can't even do anything about them. Uh, for instance, the one that I use is, let's say, some sort of acute stress or life event caused, triggered your Hashimoto's. Well, we can't go back in time and get rid of that. We can manage your stress from here on out, but we may never be able to fix that, that problem that started the snowball to begin with. So what I would suggest is it may not be the best therapy to use first line, uh, CBD I'm talking about here. Uh, what, what you might consider instead is to use CBD maybe as a once you've exhausted some of the other things. For instance, if you haven't tried changing your diet, if you haven't tried eliminating gluten or dairy or soy, um, if you're not exercising, if you're not managing your stress, if you haven't tried any supplements, if you haven't tried any of these other prescription medications we've talked about, well, then maybe try those things before you jump to, L, to um, not LDN, sorry, CBD. That might be just a, a smarter way to think about it or a smarter way to look at it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of up to you. I'd leave that up to you. One, one thing I would say, though, to those people listening is that make sure that whatever you do, you're doing it in conjunction with your doctor. Because you do, some of, there, are, there have been some reports that CBD is impacting certain medications. And so you just want to have somebody, hopefully, who's there who can kind of um, talk to you about these things and make sure that you're not doing anything that would be overall dangerous to your health in any way. So, again, the chances of that are very small, but I think it's always a good idea to have your doctor on board. Now, preferably, that doctor is somebody who understands how, why you're using it. They're listening to you. They're um, willing to try new things with you. If you don't have that kind of doctor, well, then you're probably not going to find much benefit, in which case the thing that you should do is find that doctor first and then go with through there. I'll go through the rest of the steps that I mentioned. Um, so th that's pretty much it. I would say it has some potential benefit, but what I'd really like to do is hear from you guys, especially those who have used it. Um, are you are you using it? Um, is it working for you? Uh, what what kind of benefits have you noticed or, or not? Um, what and for those people who are not uh, who are, are not using it, um, are you thinking about giving it a try? Did this persuade you one way or the other? Um, and sort of leave your comments and let me know because I want to gather as much information as I can about this as possible. Um, but otherwise, that's all I got for you guys today, and uh, otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.